It's July 19th, 1997. The world is about to witness the last entry to one of the most impactful series of all time. A film that was needed to exist, not only for the fans, but especially for Anno himself. One that needed to cover all of the events without limitations, without issues, without last minute changes that occurred due to horrible events that transpired in Japan years prior. Because as much as I love the original series' ending, as much as I love to talk about it in my previous Evangelion video, the ending of the series didn't cover everything. And so, I wasn't able to talk about everything I wanted. But today, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to finally talk about the end of Evangelion, and why I also think it's a masterpiece. There is this idea that Evangelion is an exception when it comes to mecha anime, that it is the odd one out in a genre of anime that is all about giant robots fighting, but that is not exactly true. Just as it's not exactly true that science fiction is a medium that talks about non-existent worlds. The reason these stories exist in the first place is because it has everything to do with us, with our history, with our future, but most of all with who we are. Star Trek correlates to a time when there was a need to go to outer space. Star Wars, even though it's more of a space opera rather than science fiction, it borrows a lot from our history to make the fantasy world more grounded in reality. And this is the same with mecha anime. Mobile Suit Gundam, created by Yoshiyuki Tomino in 1979, was the first major series that brought to life this specific genre. Little did Tomino know how impactful and successful this series really ended up becoming, to the point where even life-sized models were built, becoming one of the biggest franchises to ever exist. But while its success and growth is majorly due to the allure that people have of the giant robots, the series was initially focused on the characters who controlled those giant robots. And what's fascinating is how truly dark and depressing it really was. It wasn't afraid to show the horrible events of war and how actions and decisions have a profound impact on everyone involved, more than likely correlating to the terrifying outcome that transpired in Japan during World War II. And then, in 1980, Tomino ended up creating the anime series Space Runaway Ideon, which many believe to be the main inspiration for Anno, creating Neon Genesis Evangelion. In fact, the anime series also had an abrupt ending and just one year later, two movies came out. One that recapped the events of the TV series, and one that purposefully ended the whole story, which became famous for its soul-shattering ending. Sound familiar? There are even rumors that Anno skipped a college class because he didn't want to miss the first episode of Tomino's new creation. And the idea that children were the only beings who could control these giant robots was first introduced by Tomino himself. A perfect metaphor for the younger generations having to make up for the mistakes and downfall of the older generations. Which is what Anno does with Evangelion. So, even if the mecha anime genre changed and evolved into something different, there's no denying that Evangelion is at its core what mecha anime was always intended to be, as a means to explore themes that heavily relate to the world we live in. It wasn't escapism, it was reality, and Anno injected the same principle into his own creation. But this isn't to say that it was solely influenced by Space Runaway Ideon, and especially its film, Be Invoked. He has also admitted that he was unconsciously impacted by the notorious 1972 manga Devilman, created by Gonagai, which is also deeply rooted in showing the dangers of wars. But what separates Neon Genesis Evangelion, apart from everything that came before it, is how Anno approached its themes and execution. It's not just demonstrating the consequences of war. It's showing deeply laid characters that go through enormous ordeals of depression, of suffering, and all of them question their own existence, especially our protagonist. This is exactly what he ends up doing in the last two episodes of the show. But, as I mentioned before, it didn't tell the whole story. While it does focus on the most important aspect, there is still a lot missing. And if you can mix plot, characters and themes all into one, 
then you can have an ending that ultimately nails cinematic storytelling by being cohesive in its story, but also abstract in its themes. And one year later, after the ending of the series, is this exact juxtaposition that we end up finding in the film The End of Evangelion. The story picks up right after the events of episode 24. We have just witnessed Shinji crushing the only person who was able to understand him. The only emotional connection he was genuinely able to create throughout the entire series. He finds himself alone. He doesn't have the courage to go up to Rei knowing everything about who she is and where she came from. Misato wasn't able to be there for him in the way that he needed. There is no one beside him. He is utterly alone. Unless, maybe, Asuka can be there for him. But she is also completely lost after going through an emotional and psychological trauma herself. However, Shinji needs something, needs someone. He finds himself next to her in her hospital bed. And she has clearly gone through so much, but Shinji needs her. He shakes Asuka over and over again, until... We then hear these weird noises which ultimately lead to this. Shinji merely utters the following words. This is how our film starts. And what's so fascinating is how it does two things at the same time. First of all, it develops Shinji's character extraordinarily well. He is someone who has been longing for some sort of connection throughout the entire series. The father and son relationship he never had. The mum that he desperately needed throughout his life. The sexual attraction he was never able to deal with. But most of all, the emotional connection that he so desperately wants. Asuka is now the only person that he feels that can give him what he truly needs. But as much as he wants to connect with her, she isn't able to do so. And thus, Shinji resorts to the only way that he can connect with her, which is by not connecting with her. Because this scene doesn't just exist to progress our main character, it also exists to point its fingers at us, to the culture that has risen in anime throughout the 80s and 90s, to the obsession that people have in needing to choose who is best girl, to us. We can't interact with other people and thus resort to imaginary characters who can never give us what we need. So what Shinji ends up doing is what most of the fans have done. Anno criticizes us and tells us right in our faces that we are so fucked up. But we mustn't forget that Shinji is also a representation of Anno too. So this is also the creator criticizing himself. He condemns the otaku culture whilst being the king of otakus. It's such a dangerous scene to create. But Anno nails it precisely because he does not glorify it, but rather doing the exact opposite. Delivering on its themes that have everything to do with the series and the film. We want to be happy. We want to be recognized for our worth. But we aren't able to feel that worth within ourselves. We want others to find our worth for us, but no one is able to do that. And thus, we push ourselves away more and more, wanting to live in a world with no one. He is desperate, and so when the time comes, there is only one person who can be there for him. And that person is Rei Ayanami. 
Rei, throughout the entire series, is someone who follows orders. She wants to serve Shinji's father, Gendo, by doing exactly what he wants to do. She was even created by him to represent Shinji's mother, and exists to be used as a tool for his purposes. Whenever one Rei dies, there is another to follow his orders. Also that Gendo can one day see Shinji's mother again. But when the time comes, something rather interesting happens. Gendo tries to take control of Rei in another extremely questionable scene, one that isn't there by chance, and is really hard to watch. But then Rei says, and proceeds to go after our protagonist and help him. She has taken control and leaves Gendo stranded. Again, Anno is able to further raise development and at the same time massively criticize those who close themselves and use these imaginary characters for their own personal gain, or rather, for their own personal pleasure. It hurts to say it, and it's even more disgusting to watch. It really is fucked up. But just like the Shinji masturbation scene, what ends up making this scene brilliant is how Rei rejects Gendo and decides to act on her own accord, choosing what to do and who to help. To be there for someone who has always been worried about her, someone that made her smile, and most importantly, someone that was in dire need of help, because he just witnessed something truly awful. When Nerf was being attacked, Asuka was the only one who managed to do something about it. She was able to overcome her psychological trauma because she realized that her mom, who killed herself when Asuka was just a young girl, had her soul inside Ava 2 all along. In other words, her mother has always been there for her, has always been protecting her, and that knowledge gives her the ability to fight one more time. But unfortunately, she couldn't do it alone. Our protagonist still wasn't able to do anything because he felt no one was able to help him. But just as no one was able to help him, he wasn't able to help others too. Asuka ends up meeting her demise, and Shinji, when he is finally forced to act, he confronts this terrifying reality. In the span of one day, he killed Kaoro, he saw Misato die for him, and he witnessed Asuka's death without being able to be there for her. Our protagonist enters a state of absolute depression, of absolute loss, of absolute pain, of absolute terror. He is tired of living in this world. He is tired of not being able to connect with anyone. But most of all, he is tired of letting everyone down. Rain knows this. She can feel his pain, his anguish, his utter distraught, and so decides to take control, fusing with Lilith and goes after him. This was exactly what Shinji's mother wanted, who fused her soul within our protagonist's Ava, and Rei fulfills his mother's wishes. She wanted her son to be in charge of the human instrumentality project, of what would happen during the third impact, and give him the freedom to choose. It was now in Shinji's hands, in the hands of a 14 year old. Would the world be saved by him? Or would he ultimately destroy it? What is depression? You might have had a troubled childhood. You might have gone through traumatic experiences in your life and made you question if you were the person at fault. If you were somehow responsible for people not being there for you. For making people do terrible things to you. The cause of your unhappiness can only be you. You start to believe that you're the problem. You start to believe you deserve to suffer. And you want to make people like you somehow. To convince yourself that maybe you're not the issue. But the more you seek it, the less you like yourself. Or maybe you have no idea why you suffer. It just started to happen. There must be a reason for it. But you don't know what it is. And now you're in this deep hole and you have no idea how to get out. Depression is a world that has many forms. And what Neon Genesis Evangelion and its subsequent film The End of Evangelion do is showcase what depression can do to someone. That someone being Hideaki Anno. As mentioned in my previous Evangelion video, 
He suffered massively from it during the 90s, and his therapy was creating this. He needed to ask these questions. He needed to figure something out. He wants a connection. The problem is, that can never happen. As is shown when Shinji talks to Asuka during the initial stages of the Human Instrumentality Project. Our main character wants to be together with her, but it's not about her. It's about him. It doesn't matter if it's her or anyone else. And thus, Asuka continues to point her finger towards Shinji and everyone watching that what Anna wants and what we want, we can't have. Because the connection that Shinji seeks isn't real. Just like his watching this show, wanting more from it, obsessing about these characters isn't real. It's a truly nihilistic view of the world, of life. We are forced to see everything through Anno's eyes, through Shinji's eyes, and we are led through it. And so, tired of feeling this way, our main character doesn't want any of this to exist. He doesn't want anyone to exist. But most of all, he wants to be free of this pain. He wants to be free of depression. He wants freedom. And so, we witness one of the most beautiful scenes ever made in film history. How we see the third impact unfold, in the most terrifying way possible. How we see the quick edits once again drive home the psychological horror that Shinji is going through. Played alongside Calm Su Ser Tod, a song that pretends to be upbeat, as if everything that is going on is supposed to make us feel happy. But in reality, it's everything but that. Everyone starts to meet their sweet death. It's the beauty of the world coming to an end. And all we can do is just watch. Happiness. Is it something that can be reached? Is it something that can be attained for all eternity? If so, then why has no one reached it? Why do so many people still pursue it? Because we believe that happiness is our main goal in life. But as Alan Watts once said, You may be happy, and in the middle of being happy you say, My God, I'm happy. That disconcerts some people. Because the minute they begin to know that they're happy, it starts to disappear. They wonder how long they're going to keep it. Because if you achieved everything you wanted, after a while, it would be meaningless. We want what we don't have. Because it's impossible to always be happy with everything we do have. To feel happiness, you need to be sad. And to be sad, you need to have felt happiness. It's a balance. When we are sad, we want to run away from it. And then, when we are happy, we want to stop moving. We want to stay put and force ourselves to feel everything, to forever be happy, until we aren't. And that sucks. We feel awful. Why do we end up suffering? Why are we conditioned to be like this? Why? We deserve to always be happy. Even those that think they don't, you do. Because we never chose to be here in the first place. We found ourselves living. And now we have to deal with these emotions. With these people around us. With the job we are forced to have. With money that we need to survive. And so we want it more. We want to be promoted because getting paid more money will equal to more happiness. Until it doesn't. We want a family because everyone has one. And when we do, we have the utmost joy of seeing our children grow. Until we become a fundamental reason for their unhappiness. But wait, what about love? Love has to mean something. If we find our true love, we can be happy. Until you find out by connecting with someone else, you realize how truly disconnected you are. What started as love, 
turned into resentment. But what if none of this was like this? What if we could become a god? What if we could take all of this away? Would we finally be free? Could we finally be happy? This is the ultimate question that is posed to us. And the answer is no. Because despite everything that has happened in the world, despite the horrible things, despite the disillusionment, despite the resentment, despite the exhaustion, despite the disconnect, you had moments of happiness, you had moments of connection, you had moments of love. Whether it was you loving someone else or someone else loving you. It could have been your mother, your father, your friends, or someone else that can offer something that no other can, a physical and emotional love. Happiness isn't something we achieve for the rest of our lives. It's something that happens. And maybe it doesn't happen as often as we would like, but it happens. And when it does, you can't help but smile. So when Shinji reaches his ideal world after the third impact, a world with no barriers, with no rules, with nothing, he realizes it wasn't what he truly wanted. He needed reality, he needed to exist, and he needed for others to exist too. Because at the end of the day, despite all of the pain we go through, any connection is still better than no connection. This is Shinji's epiphany. This is what Anno wants us to understand. Because there are moments when we are acknowledged, when we aren't alone, as the end of the film shows us. After Shinji decides to make everything and everyone reborn, he finds himself next to Asuka. He goes up to her and starts to strangle her. Just as he did during the Human Instrumentality Project, he is still so mad that she isn't able to give him what he wants. And then she does the most unexpected thing, something that will shake Shinji to his core, something that will forever linger in our minds to this day. She puts her hand on his face. Asuka finally recognizes our protagonist's existence. He can't believe it. The mere touch of someone that is there. The feeling of someone seemingly caring for him. And then we see his emotions fall on Asuka's face. All done without ever making us see him cry in the process. The camera composition hides Shinji from us. As if it's too personal for us to witness. And then, after the most terrifying eye movement in film history, Asuka utters the final words of the film. Which can also be translated as, I feel sick. To explain what this means, well, that is up to you. Maybe she's mentioning that what Shinji did earlier in the film is disgusting, and that certainly is true. Or maybe she can't stand seeing our main character crying, maybe that's what's disgusting. Or maybe it's the idea that we can't connect with these imaginary characters, and that is certainly disgusting to Anna. But whatever the truth may be, the thing I take the most from this scene is Asuka's hand on Shinji's face. This was everything to Shinji. After everything he went through, he finally got what he wanted. Not something he achieved for the rest of his life, but rather for just a moment. A moment that he longed for so long. A moment of connection. A moment of happiness. Everything I've just said, you can't agree or disagree with. What I'm saying isn't the truth, but merely my own perception of something that exists. Just like you are now watching this video and thinking about what the series and film means to you. And then you might write a comment which I'll end up reading and I'll know about your thoughts as well. Everything is based in some sort of connection. Anno wouldn't have done Neon Genesis Evangelion if not for what Gonagai did with Devilman, if not for what Tomino did with Gundam and Ideon. And the latter would have certainly not existed if not for 2001 A Space Odyssey. That also makes us think about life. Everything and everyone influences one another. And we pursue that. To find answers. To feel things we couldn't even dream of. And we share ourselves. Thoughts and emotions that can impact someone else. And hopefully other people are able to do the same with us. 
to let us know that we exist, to make us feel connected, to feel understood. Anna talked to us through this show and film, presenting us abstract themes that end up becoming personal to each of us. There is no right answer. There is only the answer we choose to believe in. And here I am sharing the answer I came to, talking to you through a screen, telling you how this film made me feel, made me think. And I believe that despite its nihilism, it chooses to be optimistic. Why? Because I choose to be optimistic. I know there are times I will be happy. Just as I know there are times I will suffer. It's part of life. But once you have that connection, one that brings you to smile, to tears, that's the moment you know that life is worth it. Thank you for watching my video. I've been meaning to talk about this one for a very long time and I truly had a blast making it. I want to thank all of my patrons for supporting me thus far. I can't thank you enough. I love making these essays, I truly do. And thus, for me to keep making these videos, your support is crucial. So, if you want to see more content like this, I would be forever grateful if you could support with any amount you can. And it would also mean a lot to me if you could subscribe and hit that like button. And while you're here, why not check out some of the other videos I've made so far. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next video.